This is the Seller Process Podcast, where we talk about the best systems, processes, and SOPs for your Amazon business so that you can regain control of your time, build up your team, and scale your e-com empire. Hello, entrepreneurs. This is a new episode of our content series called In the Life of an Eight-Figure Seller, where we go deep into the business and personal life of successful e-commerce sellers who reached over $10 million in sales. So we can learn from them, get inspired, and apply their tips and tactics to our business. Today, I'm joined by Kevin King, a super successful Amazon seller who started his journey on Amazon in 2001. Since then, uh, he amassed a staggering $5 billion in sales from selling, guiding, and advising e-commerce sellers. He's the host of the AM PM podcast, the creator of the number one Amazon course, Freedom Ticket, with more than one, uh, 160,000 students. And he's also the organizer of the Billion Dollar Seller Summit and shares one of the best newsletters in the e-commerce community. Hey, hey, Kevin, welcome to the show. It's great to have you here. It's great to be here, Marco. Good to see you. Yes, yes. Awesome. So uh, we are... We, as I, as I mentioned before, we're uh, doing this series to give people like a benchmark, uh, what, what it looks like to get to those levels like that you reached. And so we will divide the questions into, into two parts. One is it's, a, it's more about the business. So I want to learn more about the business, how it looks like, uh, what, what's the team like, how many products and so on. And I know you have. You've got so many brands in your career, so maybe you can just pick one of them and just as an example uh, to to answer this question. And then in the second part, we'll dive deeper into your, your personal life. We want to know like more about your mindset and your habits and your 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 strategy to to win at this game. Okay, so uh, the, my first question for you is that: Do you have any business partners or co-founders that you you do business with? Yeah, I do. I mean, um, I have eight different ways that I make money around e-commerce, uh, primarily Amazon. Some of those companies, I have one major company. It's a holding company that I do a lot of my consulting and some of my event stuff through that I'm the sole owner of. Um, that company has been around since I started that one in 2012. Um, I have uh, several other companies where I'm partners in. So it's myself uh, and either one or as many as three other people in that. And then some of the stuff I do is I partner with other people. So some of my revenue sources, instead of me actually owning a piece of it, I do independent consulting, like for example, Helium 10. Uh, so I have no ownership or any part of Helium 10, but uh, I have a contract with them to deliver content. Uh, like the, like you mentioned, the Freedom Ticket and the AMPM podcast, for example. Uh, so there's, I have different structures like that. Um, as far as the team that I have to run all these, um, the reason I have eight is in case, you know, I've had stuff that's gone bad. Like I had an, a, a, a partnership with Steve Simonson with a, a company it was called, uh, product savants. And we started that in, I think it was 2019 and we closed it this year. And the whole idea was that, was that I'm very good at finding products on Amazon using the different tools and using brand analytics. And we developed some special software to actually analyze that before Amazon started releasing some of it publicly. And we, we developed our own system. Steve was very, very good at sourcing. He was bringing in about 200 containers a month for a couple of his other companies uh, um, in the flooring business and some other stuff. So, uh, and he had a team in China that was like, that was a sourcing team. So I would find an opportunity on Amazon give it to his team they would go source it about half of them wouldn't pan out because the margins just weren't good so we'd end up killing the product the ones that did work out we would then go and do a full report and we had steve had a, a team of uh of some vas and stuff that would create you know different helium 10 reports different types of reports and we make a like a 30 page document that's like here's here's why we think this is a good product here's what the market conditions are here's the keywords you should go after and a whole bunch of stuff like that. And then we would sell that to somebody. They would kind of, it wasn't a done for you service. We didn't have anything to do with the marketing or launching of the product. We just took the pain point of finding it and sourcing it out. Then we would turn it over to you. 
And then you would actually say, okay, I like this. Maybe it's a pickleball paddle set. You know, that's one of the ones we found before it became super popular. And then you go into this factory, you negotiate, you put your own brand on it. You negotiate how the packaging is going to be, how the options are going to be, and then you market and sell it. And we, we made a commission and we were selling a lot to the aggregators uh, on that. And when that market kind of crashed, we ended up closing that down. But to do that business as an example of a partnership, I had no employees on my side doing that. I did what I do best, which is the marketing and finding the opportunities. And then Steve had the entire team that he was able to leverage from some of his other businesses. And that's one of my key strategies that's different than a lot of people. I've been there and I had an e-commerce business and a direct mail. My background is direct marketing. So before the internet, I was sending out postcards and flyers and catalogs to the physical mail. And I still do some of that now with one of my companies. But that was my background before you know, all this e-commerce started. I've been selling e-commerce since 1990. I think I took my first sale in 1995. So before Google existed um, on my own e-commerce site. So I, I've been doing it for a while and I, I built up a company. We were doing collectibles and we were doing two to $3 million a year. No Amazon, uh, no Walmart, no, it was just our own website and, and people sending in checks and money orders and envelopes through the mail. And we had, I, at one point we grew that to 16 employees. And so I had a big office with a warehouse, shipping department, editing, video editing department, secretary answering the phones, people taking orders, people preparing images, you know, doing all the graphics work. And I ran that for a while and it's not where I wanted to be. Uh, that, um, I didn't like managing all those people. Um, you know, I could hire someone to do it. I just, I didn't like that. And it's like, I didn't have, I didn't feel I had the freedom that I wanted. So in 2012, we sold that off. Uh, and, um, the buyer ended up paying us only part of the money and the rest, they didn't pay us. So we actually took it back and then we tried to sell it. Uh, you know, we kept the original money they gave us. Um, but then we tried to sell it again and just the market conditions weren't good at that time. We kind of waited too long to sell it. So we just closed it down. That's when I formed the company I have now the holding company uh, in, in 2012. And I decided I don't want to have a big operation with, an office and employees and all that. I'd rather either be me and partner with people that already have that. So let them deal with those headaches and let me do what I do best and take a cut of it. And that way I don't have to manage it. I don't have to deal with any of it. Um, I can just do what I do best and, and make a lot of money uh, and, because, and, and create and create value from myself of what I know. And that's what I've done. A another example that might be helium 10. You talked about the freedom ticket that I was friends with the guys that started Helium 10 back in 2015. Uh, I originally went on the AMPM podcast as a guest when Manny Coates, who was one of the original co-founders, started that podcast. He had a Facebook group and he, I was posted in there correcting a lot of people that were saying wrong things. They're saying, this is how you do marketing or this is how you do landing pages or this, and they were just, it was just wrong. So I corrected them and Manny invited, he saw me, I was just a seller, he invited me to come on the podcast. And uh, I was like, no, no, I, I'm launching five brands on Amazon right now. I've just invested $200,000. I don't have time for that. And he's like, no, just come on, just come on, just come on. So I, I went on in March of 2016, and that became one of his most popular podcasts ever. Uh, and I just said it like it is. And from there, people started asking me to come and speak at different events. And that uh, evolved into now I host the podcast since he exited the company. Uh, and in 2017, it evolved to the freedom ticket where there was a lot of misinformation out there. There was a lot of people, um, you know, showing their Lamborghinis and this is how you make money. And they're, they're doing YouTube videos saying you sell it for 20 bucks, buy it on Alibaba for $2 and look at this 90% profit. And they're leaving out all the details. And, and so I was like, this is just wrong. Uh, people need to know how, what this really takes. So that's when we created freedom ticket, but I was going to do that on my own. And so I own the whole thing because it's my contents, my ideas. I wrote it all. I'm teaching y'all. Why should I give anything away? But I, I told Manny, I'm going to do that. And he's like, why don't you partner with us? And it's like, what would the deal be? And he's like, 50-50. I'm like, you know, I started thinking about it. I was like, okay, if I run this on myself and own 100% of it, then yeah, I, could, I get 100% of the profits. But I'm going to have to, I don't have the traffic. So he has, he, they have tens of thousands of people coming into their software I would have to pay an affiliate probably 50%. That's the traditional, you know, now some, some are 20, 30%, but back then that's like 50%. I would have to pay to them. Even if it was lower, I'd negotiate some lower. It's still a big chunk. I would have to 
hire the VAs to do everything, the customer service people, the credit deal with the credit card processing, all that. They took care of all that. So all I had to do was show up and do what I do best. It was a 50-50 split. And so I just got a, a fat wire every month. Uh, and then when they decided to make it free and roll it into the software, now you don't have to pay for it. Back then it was a thousand bucks and some we tested prices, a thousand or 1500. Now it's free if you have a, a membership to their software. When they did that, they came to me and they bought me out. They said, here's a flat fee. You know, we're buying you out of your percentage of everything. And then now we're going to pay you per month to do it. Uh, and just to keep it updated every once in a while, something major changes, go shoot a new module. And every two years come to our offices and reshoot an update. So 2017 was the first, 2019 was the second, 2021 was the third. We have not done that. They're not sure what they want to do with it now. They're kind of making a pivot to go more enterprise stuff right now. So they're not sure if they're going to redo it. Um, but they, so we renegotiate my contract, but they're paying me a fee every month to do that. So the, the point of these two stories is that I partner smart. So I could hire good people and and go out there and own the whole thing. And that makes sense for certain businesses. But in my case, um, I, I didn't, I don't want to do that for most of my businesses because I'd rather just partner smart and let and, and take advantage of the opportunities and actually be able to write other people's coattails in a way rather than having to do it all, do it all myself. So like in one of our other business I'm starting now, I have three Amazon businesses. One of them is seasonal. So it's only about five months of the year. Is there any money coming through it? But it does seven figures in the, in the Christmas season. Then I have another one that's active all year round. And then I have another one that we, we did during our COVID, but we closed it. And I have one more that we do dog products and stuff in. And, and that particular one, I, I partner again with people. So I oversee the ideas and the marketing. And then I have a team, uh, one of the partners that he has a whole series of VAs. And so he leverages those VAs and his sourcing people and all that. Uh, I, I come in and I do, I, I do the guidance and the marketing and oversee, oversee that aspect. And we have another guy that's the money guy. And so that, that, those three things together, I don't own a hundred percent. I own, you know, 40%, uh, but that 40% allows me to go and do other things and to leverage and to leverage myself into other things. Cause what if this one goes bad and it fails, then I, then I'm, um, screwed. But if, if, if it fails, I got all these other sources of income still coming in that are, that are healthy too. So that's one of the approaches that I take to, to a lot of, a lot of it. Um, and there's some of my business, you know, one of my businesses is uh, we sell wall, the seasonal one is wall calendars that you hang on the wall. That particular business I've been doing for 25 years. Um, and so we have a pretty good, healthy direct to consumer list. So we sell on Amazon and we'll do seven figures on Amazon. Uh, and then we also sell to calendars.com, which has all these kiosks that pop up in the mall. We sell to a couple other wholesale people. And that basically pays for the entire production run. So those wholesale orders cover the entire production run. Uh, we print in Korea uh, and so on, on that particular item. And then <clears throat> our landing cost is about $1.60 and we sell for 20 bucks. So we make a, it's a healthy margin there. Even after Amazon takes about six bucks for their fees for FBA and for their commission, still a healthy margin. And then I also have a list of 17,500 people that have been buying from me for years. So we email them. We have our own storefront. It's not Shopify. It's another platform. But we have our own storefront for that, that people can go and order direct from us, but they have to pay shipping. So it's not like Prime where you get free shipping. They pay a shipping charge. And we also send a physical mailer through the mail. And, and, and people send in, still send in to this day, checks and money orders uh, in an envelope with a stamp and a handwritten thing. And we'll do six figures of that. These are people that just aren't on the internet. They're not comfortable ordering online. They don't have a credit card, um, whatever it may be. And then those orders, I fulfill them myself. So I, I don't have a, a 3PL. Amazon's shipping all that stuff, FBA, but th that hundred plus thousand dollars worth of orders, I personally have a little warehouse uh, down. I, I live in a high rise in downtown Austin. I have a little, uh, on the fourth floor, I have a garage and that garage is turned into a warehouse. So I have one of those big elephants that has all the, the foam that comes out. I have a shipping computer there, weight, a scale, all the boxes, all the different things. And, the, and people say, Kevin, why the heck are you doing that? You know, that's not the best use of your time. You could pay someone, you know, five, 10 bucks an hour to do that. And that's true. But I've got it down so systemized that um, I can just go down there and spend an hour uh, or two 
a couple times a week during the busy season. Maybe maybe it's five to eight hours or something. And it's a break for me. It gets me off the desk. It gets, you know, sitting at a desk. It's a, it's a nice change of pace. And then I turn on podcasts and I catch up on, because it's mindless work. You're just stuffing an envelope and printing a label. And it, I catch up on all the Amazon or the marketing entrepreneur podcast, and I can pay attention to them. If I'm sitting here at my desk and I feel like, I, and I'm listening to a podcast and I'm trying to write an email, I'm, I'm, I'm a half writing the email and half listening to the podcast. I'd rather focus. Or if I'm driving in my car, and listening or taking a run or walk and listening to podcasts, I'm only accomplishing one thing at once. But when I go down and ship and listen to a podcast, I'm accomplishing two things at once uh, that are productive. And so that's one of the approaches that takes is how can I maximize efficiency and, and get the best results? So those are just a few examples there uh, of some of my processes and systems. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So you, you, I'm always amazed by the, the, that you are an infinite source of great stories uh, that, that uh, you know, I follow your, your newsletter. And uh, so just one question sparked <laughs> so much uh, cool and interesting stories that we can learn from. Yeah, so that's, that's great. Thank, thanks for sharing that. And now I'd, I'd like to go with you on a few like quick fire questions to get a picture of some of your brands. So, so let's focus specifically on Amazon brands. Um, okay. And uh, let's dive uh, deeper into, um, for example, the how many how many ASINs uh, and SKUs you have in total. Let's let's pick uh, one of the most successful brand you had, for example. Well, uh, uh, the 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 most ASINs in any one brand is six. I have about fifteen total, and I'm not. I don't try to have a lot of ASINs. That's just more stuff to manage. So in, in most accounts, most big seller accounts, most accounts, period, but most seven, eight figure accounts, they might have a hundred ASINs or they might have 50 ASINs, but typically one, two, maybe three are making 80% of the money. And so the rest of them are just right. filler. And so I have a rule that if I launch a new product and it doesn't, after I give it six months, after six months, is if it's not making at least a $3,000 bottom line profit after all expenses, I get rid of the products uh, because to me, that's it's just products are like stocks. So if it's only giving me a, a three thousand dollar per month or less profit, I sh I should be able to take that money, whatever I'm spending in inventory and PPC and marketing, replace it with something else and try to make it one of those eighty percent, one of those one of those good ones. And like, it's a better use of the capital. Some people would say, well, if you have twenty products all making three thousand dollars a month, that's great. That's sixty grand. Uh, can you get one product to make 60 grand? Maybe, maybe not, but I, it's, I'd rather take that approach and have winners, more winners than losers. And the reason for that is if you're like most sellers and your top two SKUs get shut down for some reason, either, you know, hackers get it or some, some, whatever, whatever reason Amazon doesn't like something you're screwed. Uh, and so I don't want, I don't want to be in that position. So I, I, I go more small. I know people, you know, I know a, a someone that just sold for, she's in London, sold a, for eight figures. She had one SKU, one SKU. Wow. Uh, and, and so, yeah. and, and her whole thing now, she's starting another company. She said, I don't want to ever have more than two. Uh, I'm going to find the winning products. I'm going to go double down on them. That's her strategy. Everybody has a different strategy. Wholesale people have tens of thousands of SKUs and they, they pick up little pieces here and there. But to me, that just means you got to hire more people. You got more labor, you got more inventory tied up. Um, and I don't want to, I don't, that's not my approach. I don't want to be in that situation. That's fine for some people, but I'd rather do my homework. I'm very good at doing, reading the numbers and do my homework and, and deal with just winners. That way it's easily manageable without a big team. As you start adding more SKUs, it's more PPC you got to manage, it's more inventory you got to manage, more cash flow you got to manage, more warehouse space you got to manage. And a lot, a lot of that's just going to be dead inventory. It's dead weight. Most sellers out there need to purge their inventory by probably 80 to 90% of what they're selling. And they, they would actually be in a much better position than where they are. They may be bragging that they're doing $10 million a year. Um, but if they were doing $3 million a year, they actually might be making more money uh, mm -hmm. because they'd have yeah. less skews, less hassles, less headaches, less employees, less getting bank loans to cash flow things or whatever they're having to do. And you'd be in a better situation. So to me, it's about, it's not about beating my chest and saying, how big are my sales and how big is my company? It's about how much do I put in my pocket 
And does that give me the lifestyle I want? Like you're a nomad, you're, you're traveling around. And so you, you develop stuff that's, that makes you happy. And so that's what I do is my business is almost a side hustle to my life. I, I start first with what do I want my life to be like? I don't want my business to rule my life. And then I decide I'm going to work my butt off and then I'm going to take a vacation. No, the vacation is my priority first or whatever it may be. If I want to go live in Bali or if I want to go buy a brand new car or if I want to have take a vacation, go to the World Cup like I did last year, the finals and spend $20,000 flying there first class and getting a ticket to the final of the World Cup in Qatar, and then what do I got to do to do that? And that's it because to me, Life is about the experiences you have and the people you meet. It's not about how much money you have or how much money can you make. And in Western society, especially, we get caught up in it, just the grind and just let's make more money, let's add more products, let's get bigger sales. And you just get in this loop that you just can't get out of. And that's no way to live. And you say, well, one day I'll, re I'll have a big exit, uh, which doesn't come for most people, or I'll retire when I'm you know 60 or 65. And I, I don't want to do that. Um, I want to live my life now because you never know what tomorrow is going to bring. I don't know if I'm going to get cancer. I don't know if I'm going to get hit by a bus uh, or or whatever. So I want to say I have lived my life with no regrets. And as a result of that, I have lots of stories, like you said, uh, that sometimes I put in the newsletter. Those are all true. And there's a lot more coming that are pretty mind blowing uh, that I haven't I haven't put out yet. But I do that to try to teach a lesson to people like, look, um, there's more to life than just business. Yeah, that's right. I totally agree with you because uh, right now, yeah, as you said, um, the the main the main uh, story it's about the hustle. So uh, it's great that you're bringing more sanity to into the business world, right? Uh, and you you're following like your passion and, and living like a, the, the re a nice lifestyle and enjoying the money. Yeah, that's that's definitely something we should all learn. Um, then, uh, so then I'm, I'm wondering if you can, can share more about what were the key factors that you think you, you have, that helped you to scale your, your business so fast and to, to this, to this, uh, levels. Well, the key were... factor, when it comes to, when it comes to an Amazon business, the number one key factor is product selection and differentiation. So too many people, yeah. they just, they don't, they don't do enough products. Uh, they don't do enough research on that. They just do a me too product. They see that this is selling. Oh, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to add an ebook to it. I'm going to add a warranty. I'm going to change the color. I'm going to add an accessory. And that's not enough. All business is successful. Businesses focus on two things and that's innovation and marketing. You need, uh, as Colin Campbell says in his book, uh, start scale exit repeat that just came out. You need an X factor. So that's a problem that a lot of sellers, they don't have an X factor. What can you do that nobody else can do? You know, in the U.S., there's Domino's Pizza. And they you know, they, they came out 20 years ago, whatever it was, with a, a, a slogan, uh, we'll deliver your pizza in 30 minutes or less or it's free. Uh, I think they backed off of that now, but that was their thing. That's something that nobody else can do. Uh, another example he gives like dollar rental car. You go into a dollar rental car to rent a car after your trip. You don't check in at a desk and show your license. You just go straight to the car and the keys are in there ready and you drive out. So that's something that nobody else can do. So in product selection, um, you, you've got to do that. Or he, another example is uh, he's friends with the, the founder of Adidas, for example. And the guy that started Adidas for the first 15 years, they were only able to scale the company to like $9 million in total sales. And then he got a break where a famous celebrity wore his tennis shoes on a TV show. And she was talking about this new trend called aerobics. And at the time, everybody was selling shoes that were for running, for jogging and running. And nobody was selling shoes that were geared towards running. And so I'm sorry, it's towards yoga, uh, aerobics. So he pivoted and said, now we have, it's basically the same shoe. It's just a different way of marketing it. And they innovated a little bit differently. And now we have an aerobic shoe. And they, they crushed it. Now they're doing billions of dollars. The same thing applies like an Amazon business. If I'm looking at a product and I'm looking, take baseball bats, for example, um, and I'm looking at a bunch of baseball bats, there's people that are left-handed and there's people that are right-handed. And so depending on which way you stand on the plate depends on you know how you hit the ball. But the bat is fundamentally the same, whether you're left-handed or you're right-handed. But everybody's just selling baseball bats and they say they're ambidextrous. They're, they're for both you know, whether you're left-handed or right-handed, doesn't matter. Our bat will work. Don't worry. 
And that's what a hundred bats are doing. But if I take it and I market it differently and I say, my bat is only for left-handed people. I'm eliminating a lot of the audience that might've bought my bat because really it will work for right-handed people. But the left-handed people go, that's the bat for me. I'll have a hundred here. There's 99 of them that say they're for right-handed. For, it doesn't matter if you're left-handed or right-handed, but there's one that says it's for left-handed people. Even though it's fundamentally the same bat, they will buy that. And so that's that's one of the keys right there that's fundamental to success is finding those opportunities and those niches. And another key to my success is I don't try to be the best seller, especially on Amazon. If you try to be number one, number two, number three, there's lots of problems. You, you're a target. You're a target by hackers, by copycats, by malicious players. You're just a target. I like to be number four to 10. And I like, so I like to, when I'm doing product research, maybe the fourth guy, the guy that's ranked fourth, he's not making very many sales uh, because er, the top two or three guys have all the sales. So that's a product I won't do. But if I see depth where the top 10 guys are all doing pretty well, I'm like, okay, I can come in here. And if I'm number four, number five, number six, I'm not going to be the richest guy on the block, but I'm going to be okay. I'm going to have a lot less problems. And so that, those are things that I, I look for and then I niche down. How, how can I do it? Then I innovate. So when, when I first started selling, F, I've been selling on Amazon since 2001, but the first uh, 15, 14 years or so were, were 1P. So it, it was a program called Advantage for books, media, and DVD. So I would send in my, my product. It was calendars at the time. And they would buy, take them on consignment. And then whatever they sold at the end of the year, they would pay me. So it wasn't, it was, it was kind of, it wasn't even net 30. It was like net 200 or something. Um, and then in 2015, I decided to do the FBA model that everybody's familiar with now, where I went to Alibaba or Global Sources. I found products, but I launched five brands at once. I started with two hundred thousand dollars, some of my money and a, and a part, a silent partner's money, and we launched five products at once in five different categories. Uh, and three of those I don't sell. Th three of those categories I don't sell anymore. Uh, I just didn't pan out, and it was too much. But two of them I still sell. The two I still sell are the products where I innovated. So the three that I don't sell anymore are products where I found something on Alibaba, made some slight changes, put my logo on it, and then started selling it. Those are just commodities. Anybody can do that. But the two that I developed from scratch, one of them was a, a uh, the biggest one that was the best seller was an Apple Watch charging dock. That dock, at the time in 2015, the Apple Watch was just coming out, and people were putting out these docks to sit on your bed, on, on your table next to your bed or whatever to, to charge it at night. And they were all like made out of bamboo. They were like $15. They were just, they were cheap looking. I made one that was $90. I, I found a supplier on global sources. I sourced the entire thing. Uh, and, uh, I developed the entire thing. I hired someone off of Upwork. Back then it was called a uh, freelancer. It was a different name back then. Uh, but I hired someone to do all the CAD designs. I did 3D printing. I developed a, a chart, a dock that was made out of metal. It had a nightlight in it. It had a Bluetooth speaker. It had something to hide the cables. You could charge three devices at once. So I spent some time and money developing a unique product and I sold a bunch of those. Another product I have that <clears throat> I still have now is a dog bowl. There's um, dogs, if they eat too fast, their food in a bowl, they can choke or get gas or whatever. So to slow them down, there's what's called slow feed dog bowls where you put a lot of obstacles in the bowl. So they have to like eat, use their tongue and they can't just swallow things whole. They got to kind of use their tongue to go around like a, a like a maze. And there's a lot of really ugly ones out there. And I'm like, I don't want this ugly $8 piece of plastic on my floor. Uh, I want in my house, I want a nice looking bowl, you know? So I created a really nice looking bowl in the shape of a bone. And I reverse engineered a couple of patents and did that and that, product it is still doing well. So it's, it's a unique product. Nobody's copied it and it sells for a premium price. So that's the other thing I do is I look for where areas where I can sell for a premium price because that way it gives me more margin. If, if there's price squeezing, if there's inflation, if a competitor comes in, I have more margin to work with. And then, but I have to differentiate that product. Why is someone going to pay? Everybody thinks Amazon especially is a, a, all about the cheap price and it's not. It is on certain categories a makeup brush or something it is um but there's people that want premium products and if you can people on 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 amazon they don't buy products they buy photos so if you're very good at creating the photos and creating and compelling them to do it you can do well another example i had you might have seen this in the newsletter if you've been subscribing for a couple months is bully sticks bully sticks are a dog treat and they're made uh out of the penis of a cow and so it's a byproduct of the cow and so they take the penis of a cow and they turn it into like this, this dog treat. 
And it's a huge market on Amazon. When you go and look and see how everybody is selling on Amazon, and they're selling 30 of these sticks in a plastic bag with a label on it for like 30 bucks. And, and I was like, I, I can't compete with that. I, I'm just going to be another guy doing these. How can I compete? So I went, and this is before all the tools did this. I manually looked at all the reviews. Now you can download all this and have AI do it all really fast. But I spent a couple of days downloading all the reviews, read what everybody's complaining about. And they're complaining about several things like, is this meat from the USA? I don't trust meat from China or from Brazil. Uh, do these things stink? Every time my dog chews on these, you know, the house stinks. And sometimes there's like a little residue left in them from the baking process and stuff. So they, they the dog jumps up on your couch and it's chewing on it and it leaks and like stains the couch. So it's like, I'm going to fix all those problems. So what I did is I went out and I found, I, I called a couple of factories that make these. And I said, I don't want yours. Who's the best in the business? And I said, oh, this guy in New England, he, he's, he's like a small little operator. So I called him. It turns out he's a classically trained French chef and for humans that turned into making dog treats. And so he had this natural process, all organic, 15-step process, and he did these bully sticks that were thick. They weren't hollow. Everybody else stretched them to get more out of it. Uh, they were thick. They they did not smell. They were organic. They were U.S. cows, all this kind of stuff. And he's like, but here's the price. You know, how many do you want? I said, oh, I need to put 30 in a bag. He said, well, that's going to be, uh, your cost is going to be $120 or $4 a piece. I was like, oh, I can't sell that. Um, so what I did is I ended up taking, there's two different sizes, there's 12 inch and there's six inch. So the six inch ones, I put five, I put a package of five, 12 inch, I put a package of three. And then I put them, I went and I created a, a, a like a cigar box, a nice kind of rustic looking cigar box. So it's kind of a premium package. So they came in a cigar box, not a plastic bag. And I had a label that was printed that looked like one of these seals that you would get. It had a texture. When you touch your hand over it, it had a feel like felt like Braille or something. You know, it's like a texture on it. So it feels premium and sealed them with that. And I put them up on Amazon. Now, remember, everybody else is selling 30 sticks for 30 bucks, and they're all beating each other up a price and doing all kinds of games to rank. I came out with my three 12 inch sticks for $54.95. So people are like, wait a second, Kevin, you can buy 30 sticks for 30 bucks. Or um, three sticks for $55, almost twice the price. You're out of your mind. Nobody's going to buy this. That's wrong. Nobody's going to buy that on the keyword bully sticks because that's a commodity term. So for me to try to rank on the keyword bully sticks, I could, I could back then you could do crazy stuff and, you, you know, launch to the, I could launch um, to, and get there, but I would never stick. I would fall back down to page two or three or where nobody would find me. But I could compete on bully sticks, no order, bully sticks, organic, bully sticks, uh, no smell, um, all those kind of keywords I could compete on at that price point. And so that's what I went after. And I had guys on subscribe and save buy this 70, 80 times. Uh, and I had the biggest bully stick manufacturer in the country who was doing all these bags of 30, see my listing is like, how the hell is this guy doing this? How is he making this? There's no way he's selling this stuff. Um, and they reached out to me said, you're brilliant at the marketing side of things. Let's partner up. We have duck treats. We have all the we have antlers. We have all this other stuff. Why don't you do a secondary brand that's in the middle? It's not as cheap as ours, but it's not as expensive as what you're doing. And let's do something in the middle. We'll fund the whole thing. Uh, you know, you just pay us after each sales. And so we'll manufacture it. We'll ship it in Amazon. You just do the marketing. And so that's that's what I did. So that's those types of things are crucial to success. You Anybody can put a product out and, you know, have a, have a hit for maybe a while, but to have sustainability, you have to have a moat. You have to have an X factor. You have some have to have something that's different. Now I don't sell those anymore because the price of the meat skyrocketed in 2019 because China wanted us beef also. And so the price just skyrocketed out. Uh, so I don't sell that anymore, but that's a good case study of like how you have to differentiate. And that's one of the biggest keys to my success and everything I do. You take a look at the, the newsletter you talked about that you like, you probably get a lot of other emails from other people in the space. And, you, you know, and how many of those do you actually open and read? You might skim them or you might look at a few, but when mine comes in, maybe when I first started, you're like, ah, here's another email newsletter. Yeah, whatever. But as you start looking at it, you're like, after a couple of weeks, you're like, oh, wait a second. I actually am looking forward to this now because it's got value. It's different than everything else. There's a little bit of fun stuff in there. There's some crazy story. There's some goofy, funny thing, um, whatever. Uh, and you're going to learn something. You might, half of it, you may be like, I already know that, know that. Oh, what the heck is this? Uh, and that's how you have to stand out. And that's what leads you to success. Um, so that's where a lot of people mess up 
is they don't differentiate and they don't really focus on what does their customer really want and how can you be different? Mm -hmm. So that's the biggest key to my success. And then the second one on that would be knowing your numbers. So many sellers, they don't know their true numbers. They know they have cash flow. They know how much money is in their bank. They know this PO costs this much, but they don't really know what is this product on a SKU level actually costing me? What's the storage fees on this particular SKU? Not not aggregate, I paid a thousand bucks in storage fees last month, but this particular SKU, how much of that is that? What is the return rate on that particular SKU? What does it cost me literally to get it on the container? You know, if I got 10 different products in my container, what is that one at the space it's taken up divided by? What is it really taken? And most people don't know those numbers. Um, they know the general things and they're using a tool like Helium 10 or some of these other tools that they're too basic. Uh, some of them are better than others, but you you got to know those hardcore numbers. If you don't know that and you got to plan for returns in advance, you got to plan for all that stuff. And that's something I teach in the Freedom Ticket is, is the people that know their numbers are the ones that actually make real money and the ones that can sell their business for, for a lot. And the other key that you need to be doing, I didn't do this in the beginning. I do it now with one of the companies I'm, I'm doing right now is I build it from the day one to sell it. So when I start, the, I didn't do this originally, so I have some books that are not the best. I have some accounting that's not the best. The systems are co-mingled. So those companies I'll probably never actually sell. But the one of them I'm starting now is from day one, I'm like three years from now, the goal is to sell this company for a, mul- a big multiple because that's when you're going to make most of the money in this business. Not if you got a $10 million company, a, a top line gross on Amazon. If you're, FB, if you're a private label, you should have 20, 25% margins, bottom line margins. So let's call it 20%. Uh, that's 2 million bucks. You're not putting two million bucks in your pocket every year and living high on the hog. You're probably putting a few hundred thousand, maybe a little bit more, and you're reinvesting the rest in inventory, new products, cash flowing. But the day you sell that company for a three to four X multiple, maybe you're putting $8 million, $10 million cash in your freaking pocket. Uh, And then you can go out and do it again. And so that's what a lot of people think, well, if I have a successful business, I want to grow it as big as I can. That's the wrong approach. You want to grow it to a point and then let go of it and leverage it. Because if, I, if I'm trying to grow a company from a million bucks to 50 million bucks, say that's my goal. And you know that's the premise of, of your podcast here is how, how do you get to that level? In my opinion, that could be a mistake um, because to get to that level, there's, it takes longer usually. Um, anybody can get to a million bucks really fast on Amazon, but that next level to jump to 10 million is a little bit, unless you just have the hottest product and you just, you just got the winning lottery ticket, it takes a, a big effort and a whole team and stuff. But what if you can do this with a less team and just get to 4 million bucks with a decent margins, knowing your numbers, maybe you have a, a million dollars on the, on the books profit, not put in your pocket, but on the books profit. And then you go and sell that to someone for two and a half multiple and get two and a half million. And what if you take that two and a half million, bank a million and a half of it or 2 million of it, take a nice trip, buy a nice car, pay for your kid's education, do whatever you want, buy a house, buy mom a house. Then take that other half of, uh, or save it, invest it. Then take that other half a million and do it again. And this time, now you know what you're doing. So this time you grow the company to five or six million. And instead of holding on to it and waiting till it, it gets to 10, 20, 50 million and selling it three to five years, compress the time, sell it now for 8 million and then do it again. And, and you can start stair stepping this up. And at the end of the day, 10 years from now, instead of building one company up to 50 million, You've built four, three, four, five companies up. Instead of exiting that one company for 50 million, let's say it's got a 20%, you own 100%, it's got a 20% margin for 30 or 40 million bucks. You've built four or five in that same time that were never a hassle, never a headache. If it went down, it's not going to kill you. And now you've made 60 to 100 million bucks. You take the guys at Helium 10, for example, They, the, the two guys, Manny and Guillermo, started Helium 10 software. They started in 2015. In 2019, they exited it. The company. I don't know the exact figure, but it was a healthy eight figures. If I had to guess, it's somewhere between uh, 50 and uh, 90 million bucks uh, is, is what they got. And so, but at the time they were growing, they were on a, a hockey stick growing up. And they're like, should we sell this? I mean, we can grow if we could, we can hang on to this. And I don't know what their sales were at that time. Let's just say they were $20 million in, in subscription revenue. They're like, man, if we just hang on to this for another two years, we can get to 40 or 50 million bucks. Um, it, but they said, look, we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know if we're going to get hit by a bus. We don't know if there's going to be a recession. We don't know if Amazon's going to change their rules and say nobody can access the API anymore. We need to take some chips off the table. 
So they sold the company for a healthy amount of money. If they held on longer, they could have sold for more, but they sold it for a healthy amount of money. Then they negotiated a second payout. They, they retained a little bit of stock and then they go negotiate. If this ever sells again or goes public, we get another payday. Their second payday in 2022, what Manny told me was bigger than his first payday. So I don't know what the number was. Let's just call it 50 million. That was the first payday. The second payday was bigger than that because of the way they negotiated. They could have never done that if they kept running the company. Um, and, and if they kept trying to grow it, let use other people's money. Let some you get it to a point where you're good at, and then let someone else take it from there and that they're good at. Someone that's got more money, more employees, more everything. So that's my approach versus trying to control it and do it all myself, which is counter to what most people think. But that's the way you get leverage, and that's the way you build true wealth, uh, in my opinion, uh, the, the best way with the least hassle and the less, uh, least effort. Love it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I especially liked uh, your, you sharing the case studies of how you differentiated your products and all the other tips, obviously. But uh, one common thing that I see and what you shared, it's always, it always come back to the, to having like a, a very deep understanding of the customer avatar, their pain points and uh, how to solve them in a smart way and a smart and a creative way. So you really showed with the example of the dog treat and, and the other examples that, that how people can embrace innovation through creativity and really um, going deep into the pain point of the customers. Yeah, so I love that story. And totally agree with you on the, the, two, the two key to success, uh, differentiation and knowing your numbers. I want to go now a little bit deeper into your mindset, like uh, the, the, how do you reach success uh, with you in with your habits especially like what have uh what have been the most important habits that you developed that you think had impacted the business the most well number one is consistency too many people are not consistent they 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 give up too soon you know they they go and they they exercise oh this hurts you know i don't want to do this this weight lifting because it hurts so instead of 20 reps i'm going to do 15 so i push myself beyond the limits a lot of times uh, and so, and then I'm consistent, you know, if you know, it's my newsletter, I've never missed a single newsletter. You know, it's, uh, it's like clockwork every Monday and Thursday at 12 PM Eastern time. And I, no matter what I do, I won't miss that. It's consistency and reliability. That's crucial in business and in life. And I, I don't like working with people that aren't consistent or reliable, even if it's not good work, still be reliable. So that's one of my mental mindsets. Another one that is, I, I doesn't have to be perfect. A lot of people are like, have I, they, they, they're looking on Amazon, like they spend six months or a year researching a product and they're so afraid to pull the trigger. Um, because this is my $5,000 life savings or, or whatever. I just go in and if I lose, I lose. I lost 1.2 million or my company lost actually $1.4 million during the pandemic. We launched a hand sanitizer brand called Germ Shark. Everybody was selling hand sanitizers and there's all these like knockoff brands and cheap things. We're like, we looked at it and we're like, I don't know if we want to do this. Maybe this market's just temporary. But we decided we're going to go in, but if we're going to do it, we're going to do it right. Just like the bully stick example, let's do all this branding, all this marketing, everything. And we, I had some partners on that. Uh, Steve Simons was one. He had the distribution and the warehouse, the 3PO warehouses. I had another two guys that were the money people. I was a branding guy. I had another guy coordinating the the, the Amazon stuff, uh, the I mean, the, the 3PO and stuff. And so we, I mean, and the sourcing. And so we launched this and we were kicking butt. We had a, a someone on at, at Amazon, one of the SaaS reps, not SaaS rep, a division head that was, I had his home phone number and his work number. So if any problems with the listing or anything, just call him and he would fix it. But we kept having this problem with Amazon. We would, we would go through a process and they'd say something on the label. We can't say that. And we had already gone all the way up the chain of Amazon and gotten permission from like their top legal department signed off and said, these guys are fine. What they're doing is fine but the algorithm doesn't reference those documents or whatever. So it would shut us down and we have to go fight this whole process. Look, we've already went through this a month ago. Here's the document and, you know, take us five days to get back up and we'd be back up selling well, doing PPC, everything, and then knocked down again by the algorithm. It just became this vicious cycle. And so we just finally said to heck with it and threw in the towel. And we had $890,000 worth of inventory sitting that we could not even liquidate. Nobody wanted it because there's so much excess stock on the market. 
So we basically had to just literally give it away. We put an ad in the paper and said, come get it. Bring your station wagon, open your trunk, and we're throwing it in. It was wipes and sanitizer. Uh, and so that's that's what we did. Uh, but through that process, we learned a lot about business. And it doesn't deter me that Amazon is still one of the best business opportunities that's ever been created in mankind. And so be, even though I lost all that money, I had a loan with Sellers Fi. Back then it was called Sellers Funding that I personally had guaranteed. So I had to, me and another guy, he, he one of the other partners helped me, but we paid about 150 grand out of our personal pocket to Sellers Funding just to clear that loan so it wouldn't mess up our credit. Um, and we, but that doesn't deter me from anything. A lot of people say, well, heck with it, this Amazon thing doesn't work. Um, and, and so they would just give up or I lost a lot of money. I'm going to go on to the next shiny object. I'm like, no, that's just business. You win some, you lose some. I've had bankruptcy. I've declared bankruptcy in 1998 uh, and I built myself back up. So my mindset is you're not going to beat me. You, you may beat me temporarily, but I'm never down for the count. I'm going to get back up. Uh, the only thing that's going to knock me out is death at some point. Uh, and so, um, and even then I'll still have be winning somehow. Uh, so that. That that's the mindset I have is I'm going to win. I'm going to find a way to win. I'm going to, I'm going to play fair. I'm not going to be doing black hat or doing anything that I'm going to play fair, but I'm, I'm going to find a way to win. Uh, and I'm not going to give up until I win. Uh, and that that's, I, I, I set reasonable goals. So I'm not like, Oh, winning to me is having a private jet and a, a yacht or something. You know, I look at both of those as like, why would the hell would I ever want a private jet and a yacht? If I had Elon Musk or, or Jeff Bezos money. Okay. It's no big deal, but let's be realistic. I'm never going to have that kind of money, but those things are just money pits. Everybody that says they have a yacht, the best day is the day they sell the boat. That's their favorite day. Not the day it's the day they bought it. They're happy. And then the day they sold it, they're happy because they're just money pits. Same with private airplanes. There's luxury on that. If you can afford it, if you're Bezos or Musk, but the average guy, that's just going to be too much of a hit. So those aren't my goals. So I set realistic goals. I live in a penthouse in Austin, uh, you know, and, and on the top of a building overlooking the river in the downtown that you see behind me there, that's Austin. Um, and that's one of my balconies. I, I drive a, a nice Porsche. I have, I fly business class sometimes with miles, sometimes I pay for it. So I do the things that are important to me and I make enough money to do that, but those are realistic within what I do. Uh, and so that's, that's where if I want to go and spend a, a vacation in the Maldives and spend a, that $12 to hundred dollars a night, I can do that. I don't have to go stay in a hostel. Uh, I make enough money to do that and to have recurring revenue uh, to do that, that it's not going to be that big of a deal. Um, so that's some of the mindset that I take is what does it take? What do I need to make to do, live the life I want to live that makes me happy? Not that makes other people happy. Not that makes me look cool and the best guy or successful. Um, what makes me happy? Because at the end of the day, that's all that matters is what makes you. And if you have a family, um, you know, makes your wife or partner, uh, husband, whatever you are, um, happy. And that that's where a lot of people lose sight of things. And they just get caught up in this rat race of build a bigger company, make, make more money, make more money, make more money. And they, they have a miserable life. Yeah, totally agree. Yeah. I love how, you know, genuine you are, in the way you, you present and you do business. So it can, that reflects then in your success. So definitely, uh, I can see that you're, you're, you know, living your life the same way you're managing your business. Uh, everything is very genuine and comes from your passion. Uh, so yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, if you, I'm wondering if you can share some mistakes and failures, like if you, that we could learn from. Um, so if you go, if you could go back in time, what would you change or do differently? So maybe we can learn yeah. from your mistake. Not exploring every opportunity. I mean, you need to learn to be able to say no. You can't say yes to everything. But I had, I've had, i had multiple opportunities that could have changed the course of my life. Uh, at one point in the late 19, uh, about 1999, 2000-ish, I was dealing with a, a company. They had a ring site on the internet. And the ring site was, this is back before Google existed. So you would you would find something at the bottom via next button or previous button. And you just kind of go in this, kind of like on social, on TikTok now, where you're scrolling and you don't know what's next. That was kind of like what it was back then, but there's the next button and previous button. And these guys, this company called BOMIS, B-O-M-I-S. And they they had a lot of traffic. So I, I partnered with them to drive traffic to my website at the time. And 
I remember one day, one of the guys said, Hey, uh, one of the partners is leaving. His name was James and uh, he's going to do something else. I was like, Oh, what, what's he going to do? And he's like, uh, uh, some sort of encyclopedia thing. I'm like, Oh, that's cool. Turns out it's Jimmy Wells from Wikipedia. That's who I was dealing with. And so that could have been an opportunity to do something there that could have changed my life. Another one is when MySpace, before Facebook, there was a, a website called MySpace. That was the pre, it's like a Facebook, but it was the early version of Facebook. Those guys emailed me at one point for my business that, hey, we want to partner up with you. And I'm like, who's this MySpace person? Um, I never heard of you. I didn't answer them. I found the email like two years later. You know, I was cleaning out some email. I was like, oh my God, uh, I could have done something here. The same thing happened with Mark Cuban. Um, you know, owns the Mavericks and multi billionaire, sold broadcast.com. But he had he has a company called HDNet. He was one of the very first cable channels that was all HD television. Um, and that was uh, in, 2004 and so he he approached us and said hey we want you to to create some content for us and we turned it down that could have been a big thing so my biggest mistakes are not exploring at least a, just blowing people off too soon uh and because mm -hmm. you don't know who they are and so that would be one of the biggest mistakes on amazon i think a a mistake that i made when we launched those five brands I talked about earlier, so we had about $200,000 in total. And that Apple Watch Charging Dock brand took about 120 of that. Um, and so I wish uh, I would not have, I wish I would have leveraged that differently uh, and spread the risk a little bit more. Uh, so, so rather than maybe doing five brands, maybe I should have only done three and done more products in each brand instead of have, coming out with one product in each of those five brands and having five products at the time. Um, maybe come out with eight or 10 products at the time. And the reason I don't advise this for new people to launch multiple products, but I've experienced, I've been doing e-commerce, I've been doing sourcing, I've been doing all this. So, and I had the money. So if someone knew they should not be launching that many products, they should start with one um, and l learn the game, learn the system, how it all works. So that, that was a, a mistake uh, that I, I made uh, that was pretty big. Sometimes it's listen to your intuition on this this germ shark that we lost these this million plus dollars on. Um, I looked at that in April of 20, 2000, uh, 2020 when the my par partners and us said, "Hey, we can do this. We have a source in India," and we ended up not using India because it, they actually weren't a pr uh, properly licensed. But we, I was like, I don't know, man. My gut here is this is going to be another hoverboard. It's going to be a fad for a while. How long is this COVID thing going to last? We looked at some reports, did the numbers, like we think there's going to be a bump after COVID uh, that this will still be a little bit higher because people will be more aware of cleaning their hands and stuff. So we should be able to ride that. Um, and my intuition was we should maybe not do this, but we said, you know what, the heck with it. Let's, have, let's do it and let's jump in and do proper branding. We had costumes made with the, that looked like germs and people running around the streets, you know, passing out stuff, doing all this social media stuff. We were donating a bottle for every three bottles sold. We were doing everything right, really good branding, really good videos, everything right. And then there's a point where we got a little bit greedy and we're like, we're, this stuff is selling really good. So we ordered, our, one of our factories was in Vietnam and then we were doing wipes um, besides hand sanitizers. So we ordered a whole batch of these and it, it was, we got a little bit greedy in our projections and we didn't put enough of a buffer in there. And that's one of the reasons we got stuck with $890,000 with inventory is we we ordered too much. Uh, and so that, that was a big mistake. We could have cut our losses probably by three or $400,000 if we hadn't have been uh, seeing dollar signs in our eyes uh, on, on that as much. Th those are some nice. big ones. Um, you know, ruining my credits when I was younger was a bit, another big mistake when I was in my twenties. Um, you know, I, I just ruined my credit, you know, not paying some bills or getting in over my head on some things. And it took me a while to, to build out, to, to recover from that. So that, that would be another big mistake is do whatever you can to maintain good credit. Cause it's going to come back uh, and, and help you in business and in life more than you might think. Interesting. Interesting. Uh, those are like really, really valuable things you can learn from. And uh, I have a one quick question before we close, cause we are toward the end of this interview. Uh, you obviously, being a mentor to lots of people and you've been advising lots of people but i'm curious to know like who who are your mentors who did you learn from uh what are some can you suggest some of the books that really changed your life or mentors that 
taught you uh, how to be successful. Like, yeah, we want to learn who are the the teachers of, of the teacher. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Um, I don't have like one. I, you know, some people will say, "Well, Elon Musk is my idol. I want to be like him. He, I, I read everything he does. I don't have that. Um, there's been a few in my life. Um, my biggest mentor has been is the is the life of hard knocks. You know, just learning by by doing. But one of my partners, uh, his name is Mark Don. You know, he I partner. He's a fashion photographer by trade. You know, and that's someone that helped me grow up and help influence me. My my views on life, my views on women, my views on a lot of things. Uh, so uh, that would be somebody. Um, it, my father and was not. He was anti everything I do. He wanted me to co- graduate college and get a job. I've never had a job. I've never made a resume. I think I made a resume in college or CV. Some people call it, uh, but I've never actually. Uh, worked at a corporation. I've been an entrepreneur my entire life. So, uh, so he always wanted me to go good job in an accounting firm or a law firm or something. So it it wasn't my parents. And that may have been some of my drives. I wanted to prove them wrong that, hey, you can be successful in this. You don't have to just do what society says. Uh, and then um, a book would be like Guerrilla Marketing. That was a book that probably, I think it was a J. Conrad Levinson. Uh, he, it's probably 30 years ago, he came out with this, I think it was a three part series of books called Gorilla Marketing. And I think he ended up doing Gorilla Marketing for direct mail, Gorilla Marketing for internet. Uh, I forget what the, there's some titles, but I read those three books and I'm like, this, it taught me a lot of lessons about marketing that are not textbook lessons that you hear in college or that you hear somewhere else. It's like real life stuff. And it changed my whole perspective on how to get down, down and actually get things done. Psychology, marketing is about psychology. So the more you learn about know about psycho excuse me psychology the be- the better you're going to be uh i'm constantly trying to you know improve myself uh and i read a couple hours a day um but i, I read i don't like reading long books uh, i like reading short form stuff so i like i like nuggets like little actionable nuggets i don't want to read a big long history of someone's life i don't really care where they went to school what, what they did at the third grade, you know, how they almost crashed their car. I want to know, get to the point of how did you make money? What did you do? What are the, the steps and the tactics that you did to make money? So I have probably a hundred books here. You know, you'll, someone will say, hey, this is a great book. You should buy it. I'll buy them. But honestly, most of them never get read. I'll listen to some of them on audio and occasionally pick one up and thumb through it. But most of, most of my information has come from experience or from short informational nuggets uh, of things um so that would be you know as far as influence that would be the books and that person um would probably be the most most influential um yeah that that, yeah. that would be nice nice yeah i love that a lot of the, a lot of your knowledge comes from action yeah so in in the end that that's all like the you know, action and sales cures all, right? Also, also Mark Cuban, it's something that Mark Cuban says, uh, yeah. right? So uh, definitely uh, we, we we can learn much more instead of, um, I, I see we're kind of in a, in a point in time where education is so available that, and then people get uh, get too much of it and then they, they get confused and they, they just overthink uh, trying to learn the next thing but uh, actually, uh, actually, you know, they would be much better off just uh, acting on whatever it is, and clarity will come from from actions and the direct their own experience will bring more clarity. So yeah, I a lot of people, have, a lot yeah, a lot of people have great ideas, but a lot of people can't execute. There's tons of great ideas, but lots of people with great ideas, but few people that can execute, and that's what separates the successful from the not successful. People that are willing to put in the work, pull, willing to put in the grind at the beginning and can actually execute an idea or a vision or a product, mm-hmm. not the ones that just have the great ideas and, and don't want to do that work or don't understand how to do it. And if they don't know how to do it, hire people that know or partner with people that know. Um, the best thing you can do is not be in a room where you're the smartest person. You always want to be somewhere where you're not the smartest person in the room. If you're the smartest person in the room, get out of the room. Uh, and go somewhere where there's always someone a level or two above you. And that's how you're going to progress in life and and learn the things that you need to learn um, more than more than anything else. And then once you're successful, try to give back. That's why I do some of the teaching. It's 
Yeah, it, it yeah, it makes makes me some money, but I'm not doing it to try to be rich. I'm doing it. Everybody needs a hand. Everybody needs a little bit of help. And so someone that took the freedom ticket, you know, they come up to me at a prosper show in Las Vegas and they say, Hey, Kevin, uh, my name's David. Nice to meet you. I'm like, Oh, nice to meet you. He's like, I really appreciate it. You know, four years ago I did your freedom ticket course and now my company's doing fifty million dollars. Oh. Uh, and he's like, he's like, Thank you so much for that. It's like that wasn't me. Uh, I didn't do that. You did that. You did the work. All I did was lay the foundation. I showed you in the freedom ticket, this is what you need to know. I didn't tell you step one, step two, step three, step four. Here's the 10-step plan. I told you what you need to know. You took that information. You formed it and whatever works for you. And you went off and you were successful. That's where I get the reward. That's the biggest reward. Not that the guy paid me a thousand bucks for the course or whatever it was. And I don't I don't brag about those people. You know, I don't put those on the sales page. You're not going to see, look at all my students. They did all this. Uh, I just let my actions speak for themselves and it, it comes back to me in, in those ways. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Yeah. That's great. What you're doing because uh, most people uh, know you for, for this course and your newsletter. So definitely you're, you're, you're contributing a lot to spreading the best information in the Amazon community. So before we close, uh, I know like everybody can, can find you in several different ways, but what's your favorite? Like, can you share, uh, how can people find you? Where would you like them to uh, see you? Or uh, or if they have any questions, how they can connect with you? Yeah, the best is probably LinkedIn. Uh, hit me up on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm also on Facebook, uh, Kevin King. Um, you can look up for my ugly fi- picture. I'm wearing like a red shirt. There's a Kevin King that's <laughs> an American football player. Uh, that's not me. Um, he's, a, he's a different color of skin, looks a little bit more fit. Um, but, uh, yeah, LinkedIn or Facebook and then like the newsletter is a great way to kind of get to know me a little bit better know what I'm doing. It's billion dollar sellers.com. It's totally free. It doesn't cost anything. Uh, but you can go to billion dollar sellers.com and, uh, and pick up that. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you very much, Kevin, for, for sharing your awesome stories and, you know, uh, you're bringing up, uh, some of the, the, the most successful traits of your mindset so that that's very useful for all of us to 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 get a benchmark on um like uh, assess how how can we reach uh uh the the same level that you you did so yeah thank you very much for for coming and sharing my pleasure thanks marco and uh, i hope uh hope this helped at least one person in some way appreciate it for sure for sure Thank you again. So guys, remember the key to success is to emulate the best. So take home the tips that Kevin just shared with us, apply it. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, need to take massive action. Don't study too much. You're you're ready to go uh, and learn from your own experiences. I hope you like this content today and um, I wish you have a productive week and I, I will see you in the next episode. Bye. Hey, entrepreneurs. I hope you enjoyed the episode and learned something from the interview. If you're serious about creating systems for your business, automating processes and building up your team so that you can transfer the tedious daily tasks in order to focus on more high level strategic tasks and work on your business and not in your business. I've created a guide for Amazon sellers named Capturing Systems and Creating SOPs that you can find at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook where you will learn how to leverage systems and SOPs in your Amazon business so that you can accomplish more by working less, optimize your time, automate and delegate tasks, and reap the benefits of being a true business owner and not simply an operator in your own business. Go download the ebook at thesellerprocess.com slash systems ebook and start implementing all the tips and insights that I share with you and leave us a review or a comment to let us know how how the content we are sharing here is making an impact in your business. And have a productive week.